This recent video by Linus Tech Tips spread some inaccurate statements about the graphics industry to millions of frustrated consumers, while lacking the crucial context this channel has worked tirelessly to bring attention to. Don't mistake the intent of this presentation. I'm responding to this video because whoever wrote the script unfortunately views the market in a way that's very representative of how millions of people still misinterpret what's going on in the industry. People need to upgrade their understanding for free by watching this entire video before upgrading their computers with their wallets. I will sequentially timestamp the key moments missing the context consumers needed, and then discuss consumers' real concerns regarding AI graphics. I will then reveal an entirely new outlook on how NVIDIA controls consumers with the help of their competitors. Before I get started, I want to thank FlexiSpot for sending me this great new ergonomic chair. It can hold up to 300 pounds and has very customizable features. My favorite part is the customizable armrest and thick seat cushion, which helped me during the long hours I spend at my desk. For more information about this great chair, please check out the link in our pinned comment. 12 seconds in and we get modern games need modern hardware. This is a very common statement I run into, but we need to define what a modern game is, and there's only one definition that gives proper context. A modern game is a video game project that was recently released for public consumer use. This definition properly separates title ports, remasters, and doesn't tie a project's availability on a specific store or pricing. For modern hardware, it would be a similar definition. So in gaming context, modern hardware is just recently released computer components for public consumer use which may include extended or redesigned architecture. The two have nothing to do with each other. A recently released basic pixel art game should not require modern hardware because it just extends what hardware years ago could produce. I'm not saying go get hardware from the 90s and develop on that. I'm saying modern hardware should at least use the equivalent GPU power as before to process that game's graphical requirements. It helps people with reasonable hardware and provides room for enhancements where new hardware was built to produce. Now this is an extreme hypothetical, but it doesn't mean that this isn't happening to a certain degree. I'll give you an example with the atrocious 52% GPU usage at minimum to render low detail, stylized graphics below medium settings in a confined and basic environment at a 1080p 60fps target on a 12GB desktop 3060. That is atrocious optimization and it's proven by our last video showing a game that was also a PS4 exclusive, yet was ported to an API that didn't support async compute like its original platform yet offered astoundingly better fidelity to performance ratio on optimized settings we showed. Ghost of Tsushima was ported to DX12, which should have allowed the game to use a PC pipeline that was more similar to the optimized console pipeline. Yet the PC port of Ghost of Tsushima came out when upscaling and frame generation were present in the market as so-called performance enhancers. It's cheaper to integrate these pre-made algorithms than to actually optimize the pipeline, and these studios knew that people would take it anyway. 26 seconds in, they seem to be calling DXR cards expensive. Now, LTT is a Canadian company, and gaming in Canada is way more expensive than it is in the US due to tax differences. In the US, you can quickly buy a GPU better than the base 9th gen console for half the price while working part-time in retail. What is expensive even in the US is buying high-end DXR cards to compensate for poor optimization. At minute 325, the presenters imply that forced ray tracing is fine because Indiana Jones can get 60 FPS on a 2060 at native 1080p. Just because you can get 60 FPS does not mean everything is okay. It's extremely blurry, but it's first person which conveniently hides temporal disseclusion and temporal issues, which is why Cyberpunk is used so often in NVIDIA marketing. With settings fully maxed out without the explicit RT settings, the lighting and overall asset quality is PS3 light despite only delivering 70 FPS at 1080p on the same 3060. Low settings basically looks the same, yet has worse visuals than days gone while using more GPU usage for a 60 FPS target. This game purposefully excludes years of non-RT lighting research, so ignorant journalists can gloat and market how much better RT lighting is for their sponsor NVIDIA. Other than how much more clear the game is without TAA, they abuse a severe blur to cover up several issues including the shadow map transitions. Optimization is about context. Great visual results for reasonable computational prices. Destroying 60% of your FPS budget to get barely reasonable lighting is the exact opposite of optimization. At minute 404, they ask why is this happening, but they give you the same repetitive pep talk every YouTuber and article gives you about ray tracing. Ray tracing is somewhat self-explanatory, but that's not the case for the following statements they made on path tracing. Path tracing is a slow, brute force approach that uses ray tracing to simulate real world lighting which is why big budget movies look so polished and take hours to render. But you'll still need quality assets to avoid looking like a typical Pixar movie. Ray tracing is just a technique to retrieve information. It can be done per pixel or sparsely. Its cost is multiplied by the times it's used and the scene complexity. And because modern shading is inherently very complex, 
that operation should only be reserved for when you have no other quality option to retrieve information via different operations, which you find often with dynamic objects. At 532, they suggest that ray tracing helps open worlds with dynamic day and night cycles. We have done three videos correcting this topic, including why mentioning light maps are just as ridiculous as ray tracing. Noisy, smeary lumen, which ray traces even on a purely software basis, only helps day and night cycles if the environment is destructible, which is a far more rare game scenario than the abused use case we've defined for games that used to use systems that bake small lighting hints based on static geometry that could be combined with dynamic light information. At 719, the chapter called Why Developers Are Angry starts, and they seem to insinuate that the temporal and motion issues with ray tracing is something that developers are disliking. That is absolutely correct, and what's an even bigger problem developers are facing is that a lot of them are engine programmers and can't get access to robust alternatives AAA had for their games, such as the systems that we discuss on this channel. At 9.10 they call Rayshade Ray Tracing. Rayshade can only screen space trace. The Rayshade looks awful with extreme sharpening, and from the footage they show, it almost seems like they maxed out Rayshade settings and blamed rasterization for a performance setback instead of their ability to optimize the settings themselves. They then state that full ray tracing can help performance, using Indiana Jones and Metro Exodus as a reference, which directly contradicts that statement. It's so insane, only AI text could write that. At minute 10.09, Linus mentions that 1 out of every 30 PC gamers on Steam are using a 1060. Those people holding L are probably doing the right thing because what they are mainly missing is 9th generation focused games that have a manufactured increase in reasonable lighting cost, or tree rendering, added with an extremely blurry temporal presentation. If you're still on something like a 1060, you're avoiding the game industry's equivalent of shrinkflation which we've seen with our food supply. To understand shrinkflation very quickly, look at this clip from 2007. Look at that! Judge for yourself, America. <laughs> this is a level surface right here, and look at that! that is food used to be larger, and contain higher quality ingredients, but you are manipulated now with packaging tricks. This is a global problem, yet we still have consumers who refuse to accept that companies will shamelessly try to gaslight them. Why did you not optimize this game for PC? Uh, we did. It's running great. It is a next-gen PC game. You may need to upgrade your PC for this game. At 1029, Linus says you have your head in the sand if you don't think you're going to need ray tracing eventually. I totally agree with that statement because the more hardware RT-focused consoles get, the more strict PC requirements become. It becomes a problem when the context doesn't make any sense or when teams don't optimize games enough to sustain the cost of good RT implementations and present a blurry mess instead. It was at minute 1040 when I decided I need to make a response to their video. The LTT team suggests that Alan Wake 2 looks and runs well on lower-end modern hardware. Alan Wake 2, even on the consoles, has to run far below 1080p pixel density to reach the basic standard of 60fps. You can barely mitigate blur with a quality mode at 30fps. So-called perfect lighting and geometry doesn't mean squat if gelatinous pixel soup is needed as anti-aliasing. Alan Wake 2 is another game that reinvents several wheels of rendering to fit their sponsor's marketing campaign for fake frames and proprietary upscaling. Isn't it interesting they still haven't provided XCSS in the game, because FSR 2 is so subpar it gives NVIDIA the easy win they always take and need. Alan Wake 2 is also a slow and dark enough game scenario to hide a lot of the issues DLSS and DLA come with. At minute 1140, Linus pokes a little bit of fun at the consumer population that is fed up with the reliance on AI, fake frames, and upscaling to sustain ray tracing. At this point, their video is pretty much done, and we're left with the task of deciphering the crucial consumer concerns that Linus and his team didn't address. 30 seconds later, Linus says people do not have a problem with AI. I somewhat agree with that sentiment because people have three distinct problems with AI graphics. The first one being the proprietary and or closed source nature of solutions like DLSS, XSS, and PSSR. They are not being developed for the sake of image quality, but out of corporate competition, and shifting well-developed techniques into half-structured versions that require the vendor AI capabilities, which is an easy path to planned obsolescence. The second problem with AI is that it's more difficult for the majority of people to achieve clean results. Now, I've already shown how AI is prone to ghosting and blurring movement, but people are not exactly in tune with the better-looking uses of AI. For instance, take a 1080p display, for example. It should follow along with your own PC since this has to do with resolution emulation, meaning unfortunately my capture software can't show everything that I'm about to talk about. So loading a game with 4x DSR, or vendor equivalent, 
at 0% smoothness or using the super sampling C-bars and Unreal projects running at your native display resolution both give rendering a nice, crisp, super sampled appearance for a big cost. Because these methods bring 1080p rendering to 4K, which boosts GPU computations four times our native 1080p pixel count. Despite great sampling on specular and thin objects, the resolve looks slightly artificial, maybe looking a little bit blurry or artificially sharpened, and may even need some extra help from morphological anti-aliasing or MLAA to smooth jagged edges. But DLDSR at 99% smoothness uses AI to downscale only twice your native pixel count for image quality that looks very natural, very clear in terms of edge smoothness, and lacks downscale sharpening artifacts. It's much cheaper than rendering four times your native pixel count, it looks great, but does it look better than four times SSAA or Unreal's downscaled 1620p? Well, I'm not going to pretend I'm putting DLDSR against the most advanced downscale algorithms, so this case is left subjective. But this is real-time AI that looks great enough that I think gamers and developers would be plenty fine if games look this way with a 60 FPS target. With AI upscalers, it's more complex. All the quote native AI solutions have rightfully contributed to AI's poor image quality reputation. These are either blurry in motion in comparison with half-competent anti-aliasing, or introduce smear slash ghosting artifacts. DLAA is largely overrated due to its significant blurring in motion, but the transformer model aimed to improve that issue, but it mainly just sharpens the output when motion is detected, which is almost just as bad as the previous behavior. I promote image clarity, not sharpness. And if you still don't see it, here's a little trick that shows how the AI sharpening stacks temporally, causing major AI hallucinations. The best uses for AI upscaling is still 1 to 2 ratio scaling, specifically from your native pixel count, which can force these AI solutions to provide better results because when the input and output resolution are too extreme, these solutions fall back on spatial AI upscaling quicker when movement is detected. This usage of AI can look good for a lot of scenarios, but you can still run into temporal issues. If you think I'm cherry picking against these AI solutions, I'm simply putting them against somewhat properly configured half competent TAA, which is able to avoid these issues for a cheap cost. Which brings us to our third issue with AI that people should have a problem with is the cost of processing it. On a desktop 3060, these solutions at 1080p are costing way too much because of the amount of issues they still introduce. Ray reconstructions cost only scaled with the input resolution when I tested it, but looking at it should raise your concern about AI based graphic pipelines. Notice how AI models marketed with image quality improvements came with cost increases. If you try to get a more competent image with 1 to 2 ratio upscaling, again that means native rendering, we are met with major performance crushing cost. Let me start you off with deterministic modified TA, which only costs 0.28 milliseconds. And with proper configuration, it has almost no ghosting. It's not perfect, but I'm aware of the alterations it needs, such as filtering modifications for its resolve and SMA, which has all been done in the past. These combined should still be cheaper than most of these native AI input timings. The FSR4 marketing campaign can tout best image quality all they want. By analyzing the existing algorithms, we already know it's going to cost several milliseconds on ninth generation hardware or similar hardware to get quality results. When FSR4 is released into the public, the industry will be flooded with statements praising the grandeur of AI for finally fixing the pixelated mess that was FSR2 and 3. This media buzz will then benefit NVIDIA's narrative surrounding AI graphics and it will be AMD's own fault for making their competitor look correct. But you see, consumers are under the impression that because AMD is a $200 billion company, their well-funded graphics research would have eventually stumbled upon a visually competent non-AI solution for upscaling. And after all these years of funding and research, they finally understood that AI was the only way to get competent visuals. You only think this is the case because you don't understand what drives AMD. At this point, I've had to edit out about two paragraphs of this video script about a true story from a couple reliable sources that told me I wasn't allowed to reveal specific details in order to protect their identities. The story deeply outlined how AMD's main decision makers will fund multiple projects to compete with the next NVIDIA buzzword technology. Instead of choosing the project that would have been more competent, AMD chose the one with subpar quality because that one could be marketed in a way that was closer to the original buzzword NVIDIA technology at the time. Now think about the repercussions of AMD blindly copying NVIDIA's format. Take for instance FSR 2 and 3. With 9th generation consoles and the 4K TV market exploding, multiple titles use FSR 2 and 3 at 4K and use the Ultra Performance Mode to reach 60fps. The Ultra Performance Mode provides an exponential drop in quality in comparison with the Performance Mode, which uses 1 to 2 ratio scaling, yet it only exists to mirror NVIDIA's format. If AMD hadn't blindly offered this to studios who put optimization on a back burner, knowing it has minimal impact on sales, FSR 2 and 3 could have limited how these studios upscale for 60fps. 
If all these competitor upscalers would differ from NVIDIA and forced a 1080p upscaling limit, it would have helped numerous titles. It is the unfortunate truth that NVIDIA is the only GPU manufacturer that is led by an actual vision for graphics, a vision that a lot of us do not like but have no real alternative to. An excellent video by Vex recapped NVIDIA's strategic history in pushing hardware accelerated software in games. This is the key to NVIDIA's success. This cancerous tactic is pushed to consumers via sponsorships and engine consultancy. NVIDIA knows full well their competitors were strained to catch up in terms of competitive support. And that is the biggest problem here. Competitors keep blindly copying NVIDIA because these companies have no real vision for future graphics. Consumers don't keep going to NVIDIA because of AI and fake frames. They keep going to NVIDIA because they're the only ones one step ahead of their competitors over and over and over again. And no one else is trying to get ahead of NVIDIA. Long-term competitor AMD has brought their discrete GPU market share to a measly 10%, and people think AMD is losing here. But they don't understand that AMD has a completely different revenue and market incentive that stems from customized hardware manufacturing for major companies like Sony, Microsoft, Valve, because Lisa Su believed that's where AMD could realistically excel at. And it worked. Discrete GPUs are a side project where all they have to do is sell you a subpar knockoff of existing leaders in graphics for a cheaper price, and people who have a frugal mindset will go for their GPUs. I mean, just look at this GI demo from AMD. It's a horrid looking embarrassment, and it performs abysmally. NVIDIA wouldn't dare release something that looks like this, because they made a name for themselves in the hardware accelerated software world, the proprietary AI world, whereas AMD made a name for themselves in the hardware manufacturing world. NVIDIA's vision for graphics is take advantage or implement noisy graphics that require poor temporal solutions, then tout DLSS as the best temporal method. AMD's negotiations with console VRAM fundamentally changed how the majority of developers build their games, such as storing more pre-computed information. Ignore this major industry shift and refrain from giving consumers a minimum of 10 gigabytes of VRAM on affordable GPUs. Because with NVIDIA's vision, your GPU is going to compute all that missing information on the fly per frame which doesn't need that VRAM. This hurts performance so much that it creates a need for performance compensation via proprietary frame gen and sub 1080p internal rendering. Not enough VRAM because the PC port didn't include our proprietary compute on the fly software? Guess you should upgrade if you're having issues. Got enough VRAM but not enough computational power to sustain a clear image and reasonable input lag even with the LSS? Guess you should upgrade if you're having issues. AMD looks at NVIDIA does the same exact thing at cheaper prices with competitive quality, meaning worse, racking in the sales from rebellious and frugal gamers who think they're independent from manipulation. Yet the two AMD owners I know have upgraded their 8GB GPUs two to three times in the last 10 months to compensate for the blurriness they keep encountering in games. Intel looks at Nvidia, does the same thing, but this time they have to target the bigger consumer market and have to stand out from AMD. They hit harder with upscaling quality ray tracing, performance, and start copying the hardware accelerated software approach with frame gen. But no competitor will get anywhere using that tactic unless they embark on a genuine vision for graphics. Now isn't it interesting that Battlemage starts off with a minimum of 10GB of VRAM because they don't have any $500 GPUs that incentivizes them to make a questionable experience on their only competing GPU. If you're wondering about the market incentive behind the 12GB 3060s, it was probably an attempt to appeal to lower end video editors but it's interesting to note that it was the first 30 series card released after 9th gen established its VRAM standards. The time I have for this video is unfortunately running out fast, but both consumers and developers need to be aware that Nvidia's vision for graphics is just to reinvent all wheels of graphics rendering to only run on their proprietary hardware. Nvidia's vision for graphics entails inconsistent imagery, artifacting, lag, or coughing up a lot of hard earned money just to still deal with some of these issues. Jensen and his employees have a vision for graphics that is limited by corporate market incentive. My Studio Threat Interactive is defining a new market with every subscription we get. A new vision for realistic rendering, a vision that becomes more clear with every video we make. A vision that people will begin to copy and extend improperly. We are the originals and we are just getting started. If you're new to this channel, we have done the most advanced coverage on the rapidly decreasing quality in game optimization, we have ripped apart marketing myths and are defining what is wrong with modern graphics from a pro-realism stance. Your subscription empowers our message, and the success of this video, like my other ones, is highly dependent on how aggressively you share our content in giant discords, subreddits, and forums, because our channel increases industry awareness on how this market works and what needs to be fixed. Until then, thank you for watching this one.